um, and um, and the topic is um, called uh, CAST RPD 101, Patient Assessment for Major Connector Design. And our presenter today is no one else but Mr. Dylan Gupta, our famous insurist that hopefully will be joining us uh, very soon. I don't want to keep everybody late. Uh, Dylan, you may start. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Elowar. Uh, yeah, I am the host tonight for uh, CAST RPD 101, Patient Assessment for Major Character Design. My name is Dylan Gupta, and I hope to join you all at the Tooth Corner very, very soon. Let's jump right in. So the contents of this presentation today, we're gonna to do a brief review of the Kennedy classification just to bring us up to speed for the rest of the body of this lecture. Uh, we're gonna talk about what is a major connector, its purpose, uh, several design considerations that should be taken into account. Uh, we'll jump into maxillary major connectors. Uh, we're gonna talk about indications, contraindications, advantages, and disadvantages. Uh, we'll be covering about six maxillary major connectors. Uh, and then we'll talk about mandibular major connectors. And just like it, with the maxillary, we'll be discussing the indications, the contraindications, advantages, and disadvantages of six different types of mandibular major connectors as well. Uh, and finally, we'll wrap it up with a summary. So without further ado, let's jump into the presentation. So the photo on the right illustrates a diagram of the four different Kennedy classifications that exist. Uh, if you follow along with me from the top left, we have a class one bilateral posterior edentulous zone. The image to the right of that, the top right, is a class two unilateral posterior edentulous zone. To the bottom left, we have a class three unilateral bounded posterior edentulous zone. And to the right of that, the bottom right, we have a class four single anterior bounded edentulous zone. One indication I wanna make about that class four uh, illustrated in the diagram, that actually is a long span class four. So with our class four candy classifications, they can either be a short span or a long span. In this diagram, they've chosen to utilize a long span class four. And just simply touching on modification spaces, they exist within class one, two, and three Kennedy classifications, not in class four. And the reason for that is the modification spaces around the class four will take precedent within class one, two, and three modification spaces. So what is a major connector? Well, first let's talk about its purpose. Uh, a major connector is that part of an RBD which connects the component parts from one side of the arch to the opposite side. It is the unit of the RPD of which all other parts are either directly or indirectly connected to. When we talk about design considerations, we want to talk about rigidity. Um, rigidity is a major requisite of uh, major connectors. Uh, through which the stresses are applied to any component of the RPD uh, and are effectively distributed over the entire supporting area. Now, the supporting area includes the abutment teeth, the underlying bone, soft tissues. Um, rigidity is actually measured via flexibility, uh, and a flexible major connector causes an unequal distribution of forces resulting in damage to supporting areas. Once again, those supporting areas being the abutment teeth, the underlying bone, and the soft tissues. Um, Flexibility can be minimized by increasing the bulk of the connector, including two planes into your design, maximizing your soft tissue coverage, placing direct retainers in ideal locations, and even adding additional rests. Uh, another aspect of the design consideration is ultimately the function of the major connector. Well, the function of the major connector is to join all the components of the removable partial denture. Uh, it provides cross arch stability by transmitting occlusal forces evenly across each side, and it reduces stress on the abutment teeth and residual alveolar ridges. Now, all these components need to be successfully, sorry, all these components can be successfully ticked off if a rigid major connector is chosen. Um, another aspect of design consideration that we must consider is hygiene. Well, RPDs need to be self cleansable and properly designed to avoid plaque accumulation. Um, intimate contact with the oral mucosa may lead to poor oral hygiene. Consistent recall with our partially edentulous patients uh, is of utmost importance. So we're, so we're making sure that they're following their at home, uh, uh, at home regimen for, for, for uh, maintenance of their, of their oral hygiene as well as maintenance of their denture. Uh, 
Uh, minimizing the soft tissue coverage uh, can also lead to better hygiene conditions. Uh, when we talk about designing our frameworks and picking our frameworks, we need to understand the impact that it might have on the speech of our patient, the phonetics. Um, things like the thickness of the framework, uh, if, if it is thinned out, can minimize the impact that speech has uh, on the patient, as well as reducing the amount of tissue coverage. However, those two points lead into my next point, which is patient comfort and satisfaction. Are we meeting the expectations of our patient without compromising principles? If we go back to the phonetics portion, if we look at thickness of the framework, if we decide to thin out our framework in specific areas that can you know, be a little bit more comfortable for the patient, even help with speech where the tongue hits it, we may be compromising the rigidity of the framework, which can then lead to further long-term issues. So we need to kind of meet somewhere in the middle with how we are treatment planning our framework designs and what our patients are ultimately looking to expect. Now, an important design consideration with our frameworks is the impingement of soft tissue. Uh, greater attention should be paid to design principles that minimize the risk of tissue injury. The gingiva are the most susceptible to injury from the stress induced by an RPD. Uh, inflammation in areas of contact that cross the gingiva is soon followed by edema. As the structure becomes distended, pressure increases, leading to a retrogressive cycle of change. Uh, the end result is the resorption of the adjacent alveolar process, resulting in pocket formation. Loosening of the abutment follows, leading to more stress placed on it from tilting and twisting. As the abutment tilts, impingement of the periodontum in, in, in compression areas will follow. So one way that we can avoid impinging on soft tissue is by assessing our patients prior to the fabrication of the framework for subgingival calculus. Uh, and the reason we require to do that is that the pressure from the debris uh, causes the gingiva to be pulled away from the cervical uh, margin of the tooth. And the gingiva is then ultimately pressed into the overlying structure of the framework causing irritation. Um, by adding appropriate rest preps, we can also help minimize the movement of the major connector, as well as incorporating slight gingival relief within the framework um, is required. And when we talk about gingival relief, we're talking about on the intaglio portion of the, uh, the framework there. Um, the marginal gingivae are highly vascular and very susceptible to injury. So care should really be taken into the design of the framework. Um, if gingival margins should be crossed, they must be crossed at a right angle and relief must be provided on the framework where impingement may occur. So when we talk about the design of the framework um, and, and reducing impingement on the marginal gingiva, uh, we can incorporate that into our main design of our major connector. So when we talk about the borders on a maxillary plate, so this is regarding any kind of major connector that is not in direct contact, bracing the lingual areas of, uh, of, of natural teeth. We want these borders to be a minimum six millimeters away from and parallel to the gingival margin. In regards to the contact areas uh, with the tissues of the maxillary uh, major connector, the contact is actually on the palate. Uh, and the major connector can be designed to take advantage of the slopes and valleys, specifically the sagittal slope, the palatal vault, uh, the lateral and vertical slope. This is ultimately called the L-bar principle, uh, whereby forces transmitted on more than one plane are counteracted easier and greater rigidity can be maintained. Um, in regards to the maxillary major connector, typically they're relieved in the areas of tori, hard palatal sutures, and areas with thin mucosa. Now the edges of the major connector that are exposed to the tongue are beaded to ensure contact with the mucosa. We're gonna to touch base on what I mean by uh, a beaded edge. So we're gonna to touch base on that diagram in a second, but ultimately what a beaded edge does is it prevents food and debris impaction underneath the frame. Uh, it's necessary to compensate for dimensional inaccuracies throughout fabrication. Uh, and it also increases the rigidity of the framework. So the, the beaded uh, edge is approximately one millimeter wide and deep. So if we take a look at the uh, photo displayed on the screen here, 
you'll see a removable partial denture uh, hovering above a stone cast. Now the areas that are indicated as A are actually the lines that are scribed into the master cast uh, to, re to, to, to reflect that beaded edge. Uh, the areas indicated B are the result of the metal conforming to those um, scribes within the cast and, and how it ultimately ends up looking on a final finished framework. Um, this can be compared to your post dam seal on a complete denture. It works in a similar fashion where it helps to seal the denture in place and prevent any debris and food impaction from occurring underneath. Um, and we talk about the maxilla, we have to look at some anatomical restraints of the palate, uh, whereby the shape of the palate, the width and the depth can affect the rigidity of your major connector that is chosen. So a wide and shallow palate, um, it, it does uh, necessitate a, a reinforced strap-like design in order to gain retention sufficient support. Uh, something like a narrow palette, you can actually get away with utilizing a palatal strap design that is slightly narrower than, um, uh, than standard principles. Um, if someone displays a deep palette, it's not necessary to change the shape of the major connector. Um, we find that uh, with the deep palette, it actually is a little bit more conducive to the retention. Another aspect that we need to consider with anatomical restraints of the palate is tactile sensory spots. So in the anterior portion of the maxillary palate, um, you'll find that there's a lot more sensation in the anterior, but, but more sparse in the deepest portion of the palatine arch. So going back to the design considerations, specifically the borders, uh, in regards to the maxilla, we know that the borders need to be six millimeters minimum from the gingival margin. For a uh, lingual bar, the superior border must be a minimum four millimeters from the gingival margin. Now, if less than eight millimeters exists between the gingival margins and the floor of the mouth, um, a lingual bar may not be used. Now, in regards to contacting uh, the tissues with a mandibular framework, the superior edge, which is the first one to two millimeters of a mandibular major connector, contacts either the tissues, now that's if you're using a lingual bar, or the teeth, if you're using a, a lingual apron or a cingulum bar or, uh, or, or something of that nature to prevent food impaction. Now, if we go down to the inferior edge, relief is based on the shape of the lingual alveolus. So if we take a look through this diagram, you'll see that indicating where there's a, a sloped type of uh, lingual alveolus, no relief really needs to be made as the denture framework essentially incorporates that relief within itself. With a parallel type of uh, lingual, arrange, a lingual alveolar arrangement, only minor relief is made as majority of the um, lingual bar is in contact with the mucosa. Where we do find um, a little bit of thickness that needs to be added is when a lingual alveolus has an undercut uh, within it. And so within the framework, um, it needs to replicate that parallel edge at the superior portion all the way down to the inferior portion to help kind of block out um, any food impaction within that area. So in regards to lingual tori, um, the best way to approach that would you know, ideally be surgical removal. But if that's not an option, we want to use uh, a design that can accommodate um, the lingual tori, and most likely it's going to be an apron design. Um, especially in cases with a high lingual freedom as well, an apron design will be your best bet. Um, now, it may not be your go-to based on several other factors, but uh, in regards to relieving a, 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 the areas where a tori is present and path of insertion, the apron design typically does work best. So let's jump into the styles of major connectors. Um, they exist in two different types, either bars or straps slash plates. Uh, so if we touch on bars for a second, bars are long, narrow, and thick. Uh, its thickness is 4.1 millimeters at its greatest dimension. In cross section, bars are half round or half oval or half pear shape. Uh, and the minimum width 
of a bar is four millimeters uh, and it must be greater for rigidity. Following into the photo displayed on your screen there, if you look at where it points to A, that's indicating the half pair uh, cross section. If we go to point B, that's indicating the half oval cross section. And if you go to C, that's indicating the half round cross section. Opposite to bars would be a strap or a plate, which unlike bars are long, wide, and thin. The width varies from six to eight millimeters to the entire length of the palette. If a strap or plate is added to a bar to extend onto the two surfaces, it is called an apron. So if we look at figure 4-4, four, four, uh, that is simply what the uh, 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 illustration of a strap or a plate would look like sitting against uh, the gingiva with a six millimeter window from the marginal gingiva to the framework. Uh, figure four five shows if a, um, a, 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 a bar or sorry, an apron is added onto a strap or plate, uh, what that looks like intraorally uh, sits against the cingulum of, of the teeth. Okay, without further ado, we'll jump into our mandibular major connectors. So the first one I want to touch on is a lingual bar. Synonyms for this is an alveolar bar. Lingual bars, as you can see in this photo, have indicated that the superior portion needs to sit four millimeters away from the gingival margin. Um, and our indications for this, well, it is the connector of choice if sufficient bracing and indirect retention can be met. Um, if future prosthetic teeth are not to be added, uh, a lingual bar is a good choice. Uh, if diastomas or open cer cervical embrasures are present, a lingual bar is a good choice. Or if you have overlapped anterior teeth, a lingual bar is a good choice. Where it doesn't seem to work out, well, if you have less than eight millimeters of depth from the cervical margin to the floor of the mouth, a lingual bar will not be sufficient. Uh, if only a few remaining anterior teeth exist and they must be braced, your lingual bar will not be efficient. Uh, if you have lingually inclined teeth, well, that's going to affect the path of insertion for how that lingual bar works. Um, and most probably it won't be um, passive in order for that denture to sit properly, as well as a lingual alveolar undercut. If there's too much of an undercut, the denture, mainly the superior portions, will not be in intimate contact with the mucosa. Forget about the inferior portions. Uh, it's just going to leave a giant food trap. Um, so some advantages over the lingual bar uh, versus uh, disadvantages, well, minimum surface area coverage. It's a patient preference due to comfort and aesthetics. Disadvantages, well, it's not as rigid as a lingual apron. It's difficult to add additional prosthetic teeth if the patient were to lose more of their natural teeth. And the dimensional changes between the thickness of components leads to weak areas. Um, the thickness of the direct retainers versus the indirect retainers versus the minor connectors versus the major connectors are all different dimensions. And when you have a major connector that is not very rigid to begin with and throwing in all these other dimensional instabilities, you're gonna have weak points within that entirety of the prosthesis. Our next major connector I wanna to touch on is the lingual plate, otherwise known as a lingual plate, lingual apron, or the closed Kennedy. Um, and so indications for this, well, if you have less than eight millimeters of space between the gingival margin and the floor of the mouth, um, if you have a few remaining anterior teeth that need to be braced, um, an undercut or parallel lingual, parallel lingual alveolar ridge where superior border of lingual bar cannot be in close contact with the mucosa or mandibular tor exostosis which cannot be removed and must be covered by the RPD. Contraindications, well, if a lingual bar can suffice, we would like to utilize that. Um, if you have overlaps of anterior teeth, uh, it'll actually create food traps around the superior border of the apron. Uh, so if you can picture um, your bottom six anterior teeth that are all crowded, overlapping each other. Um, and if we think about a apron sitting in intimate contact behind those teeth on the lingual, there's gonna be gaps between the surface of the uh, metal and the actual tooth surface because of the nature of how those teeth are crowding. Uh, lingually inclined teeth are also a contra, contra indication. Uh, diastomas, 
Um, as you can see in this photo, I've actually found an illustration that incorporates uh, a slotted design whereby the diastemas uh, will not, through the diastemas, you will not be able to see the framework, um, as well as open surgical, cervical embrasures for aesthetic purposes. Now, a lingual plate, what are the advantages and disadvantages of it? Well, it's more, more rigid than a lingual bar, uh, metallurgically and structurally simple. It's easy to add additional teeth to the framework, and it may also prevent super eruption of contacted teeth. Disadvantages, well, more surface area is covered than a lingual bar, which ultimately won't be as comfortable for the patient. Um, it can also cause flaring of incisors if the cingulate is contact while the base rotates into the tissues. So if you have a situation where it is a class one posterior, uh, two bilateral posterior dentalist zones and a lingual apron is utilized to brace the anterior teeth, we may find that the rotation of the denture base uh, from the posterior to the anterior uh, may actually cause pressure onto the incisor teeth, which can then flare it out. A lingual bar with a continuous bar indirect retainer. Synonyms for this, candy bar, double lingual bar, split lingual bar. Um, I'm sure your lab tech would be upset if you wrote that very long name out on the prescription as opposed to just writing a Kennedy bar. Um, we like to stick with the simple names over here. Um, indications for this. Well, where the major connector must contact the natural teeth to provide bracing and indirect retention uh, with open cervical embrasures. Um, where a lingual plate may not be utilized. Um, but for this, you need to have adequate space for the lingual bar portion of the framework. That eight millimeters of depth, of depth needs to exist for us to be able to utilize a Kennedy bar. Contraindications for this. Well, where a lingual bar or lingual plate suffice, any contraindication of a lingual bar, any contraindication for a lingual plate minus open cervical embrasures and diastemas. And I'm just gonna to quickly touch on those contraindications of a lingual bar and a lingual plate. Um, so for a lingual bar uh, and a lingual plate, less than eight millimeters of room, only a few remaining teeth that need to be braced, lingually inclined teeth, lingual alveolar undercut or overlapped interior teeth. So any of those contraindications you've heard there are contraindication uh, for a Kennedy bar. An advantage of a Kennedy bar is well, it's more rigid than a lingual bar and it covers less surface area than a lingual plate. However, the disadvantages are, well, it's a very complex design and there's more edges exposed to the tongue. Uh, so the patient will really be playing with that Kennedy bar in and out between the spaces between the two bars quite often and probably moving their tongue all the way around it, trying to dislodge it. Okay, a labial bar. Uh, so a labial bar indications are lingually inclined teeth preventing use of any of the lingual major connectors. Uh, if lingual tori or exostosis which cannot be removed or covered by uh, a removal partial denture, uh, a lingual major connector cannot be used due to the slope or the undercut of the lingual alveolar ridge. The patient cannot tolerate a lingual major connector or if there's diastemas and open cervical embrasures contraindicating a lingual plate. Contraindications for a labial bar, uh, where a lingual connector may be used, uh, if facial tori or exostosis exists, uh, if there's an alveolar ridge undercut on the facial aspect uh, of the patient, or if there are high facial muscle attachments resulting in less than three millimeters of space between the marginal gingiva and the superior portion of the framework. So an advantage to the labial bar is, well, it can be used when a lingual major connector is not an option. Disadvantages, well, it's longer than a lingual major connector, therefore must be wider for rigidity. And when we talk about wider, we're talking about increasing the thickness, um, as well as it may be visible when the patient smiles or even adds the bulk to the lower lift. Um, it's also difficult to add additional prosthetic teeth to the uh, framework if further natural teeth were to fail. Okay, cingulum bars. So an indication for a cingulum bar is if the height of the lingual frenum and floor of the mouth are at the same level as a marginal gingiva. Uh, if you have inoperable tori or exostosis at the same level as a marginal gingiva, a severely undercut lingual alveolus, uh, 
uh, or a concern that a major connection traversing the gingival sulcus will cause a periodontal problem, or if there's considerable gingival recession. Contraindications uh, for a single lumbar is when a simpler major connector may be used, uh, or diastomus in open cervical embrasures where the metal will show. An advantage to a single lumbar is it can be used where a lingual bar and a lingual plate cannot be. Uh, it does not traverse the marginal gingiva or overlay the lingual alveolus. Um, it's easy to add prosthetic teeth to the framework if further natural teeth were to fail. Disadvantages, well, it must be bulky for sufficient rigidity. In that case, uh, the patient comfort is generally compromised there. Um, once again, if we have a very bulky um, framework around where the tongue is constantly uh, hitting it, they will constantly be playing with that framework uh, and constantly be trying to dislodge it. Um, it's just a parafunctional habit. Sublingual bars. Okay. So uh, indications for this are when bracing and indirection, indirect retention can be provided by clasp and retainers. If there's really undercut lingual alveolar ridge, um, distal extension RPD situations with sloped or parallel lingual alveolar ridges where a lingual bar would rotate into the lingual alveolus as the bar areas rotates tissuewards. Diastomas and open cervical embrasures, overlapped anterior teeth, or simply just intolerance to other lingual major connectors. Um, contraindication for this, where a lingual bar or a lingual plate will suffice. Situations where bracing and or indirect retention must be provided by contact of the major connector with the teeth. Situations where future additions of prosthetic teeth to the framework are anticipated. The advantages of a sublingual bar, well, it does not contact anterior teeth or the lingual alveolus. Uh, it's more aesthetic than any other uh, lingual major connector because of its location. And it's more rigid than a lingual bar because the bulk of its metal is horizontal rather than vertical. However, disadvantages to it, well, it requires border molded impressions of the floor of the mouth for accurate placement of the major connector. It is difficult to add prosthetic teeth to the framework and most patients prefer a lingual plate to a sublingual bar. Okay, so that wraps up our mandibular major connectors. We're gonna jump into the maxillary major connectors here. Uh, first one we'll start with is the palatal strap. Synonyms for this are palatal plate, mid-palatal strap, or simply just a plate. Uh, indications for this framework is a class three or a class three mod one partially edentulous arches. Um, Contraindications for this are tooth tissue supported RPDs, uh, palatial torus, uh, or extremely long tooth supported edentulous spaces. So a very long class three span uh, sometimes a palatal strap is not very ideal for those kinds of situations. Advantages of a palatal strap, well, it's a very simple design. The posterior border is well anterior to the hamular notch, that's vibrating line, so it's comfortable for the patient to wear. Uh, and the anterior border is posterior to the rugae, which is the playground of the tongue. Um, very few metal tissue edges. So overall, this is a very comfortable device uh, for patients who are able to get into something like this. Now, a disadvantage of this is it can cover a considerable portion of the palate. Palatal plate. Uh, synonyms for this are broad palatal strap slash plate, posterior palatal strap slash plate, broad palatal major connector. Indications for this are class one or class two partially edentulous arch. Contraindications, a tooth supported edentulous space or a palatal torus. Now, an advantage to the palatal plate is support is provided by contact of the major connector with the denture bearing foundation of the palate. There's great retention due to intimate contact with the mucosa. It's also a fairly simple design. Disadvantages, well, a considerable amount of the coverage of the palate is incorporated into the denture framework. Uh, and the anterior border typically sits within the rugae. So when we talk about playground of the tongue, um, that sensitive area where a lot of tactile spots are uh, will be engaged constantly, uh, typically by a palatal plate. Complete palatal coverage, synonyms, full palatal coverage, complete palatal plate or strap. 
indications. Class one, partially dentulous arch, where maximum utilization of the plate is indicated for support, bracing, retention, and direct, indirect retention. Contraindications, when less than complete palatal coverage is necessary. Sufficient remaining natural teeth to use a palatal plate or strap major connector. An advantage of a palatal plate or complete palatal coverage, well, maximum support retention bracing and direct indirect retention from the palate. It's a fairly simple design, very few metal tooth edges. It's easy to add prosthetic teeth to the framework. It can also be easily converted to an interim complete denture. However, the disadvantages are that it covers more tooth and tissue surface than any other major connector. Um, there's a heavy indication for altered phonetics as it does impact where the tongue hits the roof of the mouth. It also can be very heavy. Um, and one point I want to want to point out regarding uh, the weight of a complete palatal coverage uh, prosth prosthetic connector is if this was to be converted to an interim complete denture, suction will be affected due to the weight of this maxillary plate. So that's one thing to keep an eye on uh, to save costs. I know we like to convert existing parcels to completes if possible, but sometimes they don't work out very good. And it's really hard to keep them in utilizing denture adhesive uh, because it just doesn't stick onto the metal surfaces as well as we want it to. Our next major maxillary major connector we're gonna talk about is the anterior posterior type. Um, synonyms for this are the AP type, the ring shape, donut shape, Closed horseshoe, closed horseshoe or circular. Um, indications for this are class three or class three mod one partially dentulous arch with long span dentulous spaces. Class one or class two partially dental arch where adequate support retention bracing and direct indirect retention may be obtained. An inoperable palatal torus or an RPD replacing anterior teeth. A contraindication for this is that palatal opening um, cannot be less than 15 millimeters anterior, posteriorly, or medial laterally. Um, if there's not enough support, retention, bracing, and direct indirect retention from this plate, it's going to be a contraindication. And ultimately, if a, if a simpler major connector design can be utilized, um, it's advised to do so. Now, advantages of the anterior posterior type, uh, well, it covers a minimal amount of palatal tissue. Uh, it's the highest rigidity of all maxillary major connectors. Uh, and there are strapped in two different planes, which offer a favorable design for most clinicians. Uh, touching back to that L bar principle where, you know, we want to take advantage of the slopes and valleys uh, within the maxillary arch, specifically the sagittal uh, slope, the palatal vault, the lateral and vertical slopes. Um, that touches on the L bar principle, which is uh, where when forces are transmitted on more than one plane, uh, they are counteracted easier and greater rigidity can be maintained. Disadvantages to a, an AP type. It's a very complex design. There are a lot of metal tissue edges. The posterior palatal bar or strap frequently does not fit the palate closely. The anterior border is frequently located in the, U, uh, in the rugae. Uh, and the posterior border is frequently located in the hamular notch slash vibrating line area. A U-shaped um, maxillary major connector. Synonyms for this are an anterior palatal strap, a horseshoe, open ring, open donut. Indications for this, a class four partially dentulous arch, a class three or class three mod one partially dentulous arch with an anterior dentulous space where cross arch force distribution is not important. A partially dentulous arch with an inoperable palatal torus and some class one and class two scenarios. However, we need to take into account, um, you know, retention, bracing, support, direct and indirect uh, retainers when we're looking at utilizing this for a class one and class two scenario. Contraindications for this, well, uh, where support, retention, bracing, and direct indirect retention from the palate is necessary uh, because it doesn't cover majority of the palate. If palatal coverage is necessary, well, this is not going to work out very well for you. Uh, and also, if cross arch force distribution is necessary, uh, this major connector would not be uh, your choice in the box. Advantages of a U-shaped uh, major connector, well, there's minimal coverage of the palate. It's a fairly simple design. 
and fewer metal tooth or tissue edges than an AP design. Disadvantages, well, it's not as rigid as uh, other maxillary major connectors. It's actually the weakest of all the maxillary major connectors. Um, and it, rigidity may be increased by having the metal in the vertical and horizontal planes. Um, and so that's essentially going back into that L bar principle uh, by having the, the, um, the, the major connector elements exist both horizontally and vertically. Now, posterior palatal bar. Indications for this? Well, it's rarely. It's actually limited to short span class three applications. Contraindications to this are palatal torus. Um, an advantage to a posterior palatal bar, well, minimal tissue coverage. Uh, it, it shouldn't be placed anterior to the second molar position. Uh, so it's not really going to bother the patient too, too much. Uh, however, it must be bulky for sufficient rigidity, uh, which then will in turn affect the patient's comfort and can affect the speech uh, of a patient. Okay, so a quick summary. Rigidity is the primary requisite for a major connector. Retention, support, and bracing must also be considered. Choosing the right major connector depends on numerous variables. Rigidity may be compromised for comfort. And this is a quick little uh, slide I put together from some information I found from my school days. Uh, a quick little reference guide for you uh, regarding maxillary major connectors. The mandibular slide will come up next, uh, but kind of just a reference. If there is weak periodontal support, your go-tos would be a wide paddle strap or a complete palate. If there is adequate periodontal support, a paddle strap or a closed horseshoe would suffice. A long span distal extension, closed horseshoe or a complete palate, anterior teeth to be replaced, open or closed horseshoe, complete palate as well. In the presence of torus, closed horseshoe, a horseshoe, or an AP bar. When we talk about the mandibular major connectors as a quick reference guide. Well, if it's a tooth support RPD, a lingual bar will suffice. If there's insufficient room between the floor of the mouth and gingival margin, a lingual plate will be necessary. Uh, if there's anterior teeth with reduced periodontal support, a lingual plate will be necessary anterior teeth with reduced periodontal support and large interproximal spaces, a Kennedy bar will be suffice. And replacement of all mandibular posteriors, a lingual plate will be your best option. I'd like to thank you for giving me the time tonight to present on CAS RPD 101, patient assessment for the design of a major connector. My name is Dylan Gupta and I open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Dylan. That was really very informative. I can say even I uh, still like, you know, the information that you did present, even though that we all had to, uh, you know, uh, do it uh, when we were in dental school. And I remember how much of torture that used to be to remember all the designs and everything, but you actually simplified it and you made it up very uh, easy. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that I am one of the people that I'm going to ask you to see if you can uh, have to forward Dr. Sally, maybe uh, a PDF file or something like that, and maybe we can share it up with the group, at least like your summary or something like that, because I found this very, uh, you know, useful uh, for all of us, if it's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely, uh, for Thank sure. You. you know, even Thank while you. putting this, Thank even you. while putting this lecture together, I, I, uh, I thought it was really useful as well. And I was actually really excited to present this topic to the associates. So definitely, thanks. Thanks for those words, Thank Dr. Son. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, guys, any questions for Dylan? So if you have any questions, Dylan, because I'm driving, I cannot see the, uh, the chat. So if you don't mind, keep your eyes on the chat and uh, see if anybody has any questions at all and please answer them. Like read the question Will and answer. Do. Yeah, currently there are no questions pending in the chat box, but I am keeping They all know how to do partial dentures. <laughs> That's good, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe you can ask Dr. Vassal a question. Let's see. Dr. Basil, are you there? Are you online? We'll have to table my question till next time. <laughs> I, think, I think you have to unmute him. I think you have to unmute him. Oh, okay, okay, hold on. Because he doesn't have the ability right. to unmute himself. Uh, 
Right, right, right. Let's see, Dr. Basel. Okay, hold on. We got a question here from Dr. George. How a patient with missing lateral incisors, maxillary, it was hard to design a framework that worked for the patient. Dr. George, I have some follow-up questions for that. Um, is it because the space between the arches was very tight in the lateral area uh, with the opposing dentition? If it was, in that case, yes, I understand how difficult it can be to design a framework within that region. Um, it has happened to me. Uh, yes, no space inclusion, exactly. Um, you know, typically, I'd like to stray away from adjusting the opposing occlusion, but if, if that's the only option to create some space, we need to do that. Um, ideally, um, that, that really is almost the only solution I find unless we put the teeth positioned further anteriorly from uh, the rest of the, the way the teeth are in, 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 in the form, but that's not ideal for the patient aesthetically and for lip bulk. Um, so what did you end up doing in regards to that case? Did you end up adjusting the lower occlusion there? Oh, wow. I'm assuming it was really thin in those areas where um, the lateral teeth would connect to the major connector. Um, it's happened to me too. Um, you know, ultimately we were able to deliver a framework that did meet the needs of the patient. We did have to compromise on certain design components to be able to get the right spacing in there. Um, and, it, and it held up. So I'm happy with that. Um, if it were to break, I were to under, I would understand why it would break, um, and that that's something I had to explain to the to the multiple patients that were in those scenarios for sure. Any more questions, people? No, that's currently it so, for now. All right. Did you did you uh, prepare any questions uh, at all, or not for the sake of the continued education? Or no, I did. I, I prepared ten questions. I emailed it to Doctor Sally. Who? Oh, yeah. I heard the poll is up already. There we go. All right. So can you please look after that because I'm actually driving sure. right now, coming up from sure. there. No problem. You can do that. No problem. And maybe at the end we can read the questions and. And have a discussion for the answer why the choices were. Absolutely, sure thing. So I'll give everyone about five minutes. So about 10.30, we'll take a look at the answers to the poll. Oh, okay, so I see another question come up in the chat box just while the poll gets done. Uh, Dr. Rabi Hassan has asked, how do you tackle mandibular tori? Ideally with mandibular tori, surgery is the best route. Um, now, in most cases, the patient probably will not take that avenue. Um, and so it's really deciding on a framework that can incorporate relief into that area. And typically it is going to be a lingual apron. Um, because of the nature of the lingual tori, the lingual apron will probably sit shallower on the tissues there within the vestibule, um, and there probably will be a little bit more movement. However, in some cases, if your design is really good, you can actually get some retention around the tori, and that really depends on how big it is. Um, but yeah, to go back to your question, ideally surgery or, you know, utilizing a lingual apron to incorporate the appropriate relief. Thanks for the um, question. I mean, uh, 
if, if you allow me to add a little bit about, you know, in, in sure. situations of debular tori, I, I totally agree with you. Surgery is probably uh, is the best solution. And especially when we talk about mandibular tori, where the uh, morbidity of the situation is not that severe. So technically speaking, uh, there is very little risks apart from the usual risk of surgery, swelling, pain, bleeding, bruising, possibility of infection. But comparing this to uh, Tori Palatinus, it's just like it's a little bit more devastating the outcomes as well. And the palatal tori is a little bit more severe because you can always end up with fistulas. And this is one of the things that people don't realize is that literally speaking, what lies under the palate is, is literally the floor of your nose, right? So if you think about it from this perspective and you start to remove the tori, a lot of the time, you're gonna end up with a fistula thinking though that's so easy, especially for people who started to experiment in surgery and, you know, did a little bit of uh, mandibular tori and they can carry on and proceed and they think, oh, I can do the, it's the same situation, it's so easy. It's actually one of the most trickier situation. And the fistulas are probably one of the worst to close because the tissues are very much attached. Uh, so if you think about it, you're, you're, you cannot really uh, stretch the tissues to obtain primary closure to close up the fistula and most of the time you end up with situation like a, a, a tongue uh, uh, you know flap or something like that so that uh, you know you can uh, uh, you can close the fistula so just a, a rotation uh, is a good thing that you probably can dodge the uh, tori palatinus you probably can dodge it right with uh, with your this design uh, alteration. But with the mandibular tori, uh, you know, there is there's ways that surgery is definitely not as severe outcome. And patients most of the time accept it that the only, I would probably say the only downside to it if the patient is uh, medically compromised or there's a medical condition that is going to contraindicate of the treatment of uh, surgical removal of mandibular tori. But that's like a small thought of me. And I'm sure some people may agree, some people may disagree, but uh, you know, that's my small thoughts about that. Well, wow, no, thank, thank you for those contributions. Yeah, appreciate that. Okay, we got six votes in, two minutes left on the clock. Hi there. Good, uh, good evening. My name is Sophia, and uh, I do have some background in regarding RPD. Um, I just had a question. Actually, uh, just got into the meeting, so I apologize. But for the mandibular tori um, assessment here that we were talking about, uh, I actually find that very interesting. So, what is the healing time and period for after a surgery like that? And then, how about do we go? Um, making that lower denture for that individual? And is there any sensitivity involved and also how long the healing period is after a surgery like that? Wow, that was a really good question. Uh, in regards Sophie, to the healing period, I'm gonna pass that. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Zong. Go Sophie, ahead, Sophie, how are you, Sophie? Hi, so surgery, Hi. surgery by surgery, I mean, it's very unique from an individual to the individual. Uh, I remember on, on my days of uh, NYU, I mean, I used to do like probably three of these every single day. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, it varies from a person to a person, really, right? So you probably got uh, people, uh, and I'm talking only about the surgical, the surgical point, right? So the way that the patient can assume taking an impression and all that, that I probably say in a couple of weeks, to three weeks in the normal case scenario, probably I would say 10 days after primary healing stage has happened. So when I see the patient and I see that sutures have resolved, it's probably take about five to seven uh, days. I personally would probably advise the patient not to get an impression for another two weeks. Uh, that's from my point of view. Uh, I don't know from the prosthodontic point of view, I don't know what do you guys do when you do the impression? How long do you wait? With regards to the outcome of this surgery, as I said, the 
major, major or the major outcomes or the major side effects that I would like to warn the patients about: swelling, pain, bleeding, bruising, possibility of infection. As well, we have to identify what lives in there. We have to identify that the top of the mucosa is very, very thin, and you can easily tear it because if you really think about it, you have to be very, uh, very. Um, um, uh, how am I going to say, artistic when you raise your flap, so you can dot your way around up the undercuts of the uh, of the uh, toroid, and at the same time, you may understand that the toroid doesn't always come in one piece, it may come up like in a, kind of like a different shapes, and in this case, it gets a little bit difficult to raise your flap around it. You have to understand as well about your Sometimes you can have uh, your submandibular duct, submandibular gland duct, sublingual glands ducts that can actually come out of there. You don't want to, when you suture, you don't want to tear it. You don't want to sever it, so you don't create a, a salivary gland fistula. So there is a lot of things that to take into consideration. And obviously the risk of the infection in a very dangerous area over there. And as well, uh, if you trying to raise your flap, remember not to go posteriorly so much because of your facial nerve and identify where your, uh, sorry, not your facial nerve, your lingual nerve and identify where your lingual nerve is. That's from the surgical point of view. From the personotic point of view, I think uh, Dylan can answer the rest. <coughs> sorry. Yeah, from, from the prosthodontic point of view, um... Once that healing period has commenced, like Dr. Hassan said, after the three weeks, I would follow just standard impression protocols. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's exactly what I was uh, inquiring about. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Really appreciate it. No problem. Okay, I think we got we got about 15 out of 22 votes here. It's about 68% of voted. As soon as that tips, 70% of the participants have voted. We will start taking up this quiz. We need one more person to vote. Guy, okay, this is uh, this is actually is. Uh... It's like nobody, nobody will know who did what. So don't be embarrassed. Just do it, and just for the sake of continued education. Uh, so that when we submit to the college, we can uh, certify your points. That's the only reason. Hello, doctor. Okay, we officially hit the 10 minute mark that this poll has been on the screen and we have tipped over the 70% participants. So let's take up the questions. Starting with number one, the primary requisite of any major connector is A, comfort, B, function, C, rigidity, D, hygiene. Correct answer for this one is C, rigidity. Next question. The gingiva is most susceptible to injury from RPD-induced RPD stress. A, true. B, false. Answer is A, true. Next question. Question number three. The minimum distance for the borders of any palatal connector must be A, three millimeters, B, four millimeters, C, eight millimeters, or D, six millimeters. Correct answer for this one is D, six millimeters. Question number four. The beaded edge of a maxillary major connector serves what purpose? A, prevents food and debris from slipping underneath the frame. B, compensates for dimensional inaccuracies during fabrication. C, increases rigidity of the framework. Or D, all of the above. The correct answer is D, all of the above. Question number five. The superior border of a lingual bar must be a minimum blank millimeters away from the gingival margin. A, two millimeters, B, four millimeters, 
C, must be in contact with the margin, or D, six millimeters? The answer is B, four millimeters away from the gingival margin for the superior border of a lingual bar. Question number six. A bar major connector is long, wide, and thin, whereas a strap slash plate major connector is long, narrow, thick. A, true, B, false. Whoa, this one got 50-50 right down the middle for responses. The correct answer is, drum roll, B, false. Uh, a bar major connector is actually long, wide, and, uh, sorry, long, narrow, and thick, where a strap slash plate is actually long, wide, and thin. I just twisted around the definitions on that one. Number seven, a patient is in need of a mandibular RPD and has less than eight millimeters of space available between the free gingival margin and the floor of the mouth. Which of the following options could potentially work for them? A, a lingual bar. B, a palatal strap. C, a lingual plate. Or D, a and C. The correct answer is C, a lingual plate. Uh, mind you, the main requirement for a lingual bar is eight millimeters of space between the gingival margin and the floor of the mouth. If that cannot be met, you must be utilizing a lingual plate slash lingual apron. Question number eight. The mandibular major connector of choice, if bracing and indirect retention can be met, is A, a lingual bar, B, a lingual plate, C, cingulum bar, or D, a labial bar? The correct answer is A, a lingual bar. Question number nine. The highest rigidity of any maxillary major connector is A, a palatal strap, B, an anterior posterior type, otherwise known as a closed horseshoe, C, a U-shaped, otherwise known as a horseshoe, or D, posterior palatal, palatal bar. The answer for highest rigidity of any maxillary major connectors is B, the anterior posterior type, otherwise known as a closed horseshoe. 10, pick the maxillary major connector that is rarely used. A, a closed horseshoe. B, a U-shaped. C, posterior palatal bar. Or D, a palatal strap. And the answer for the least likely used maxillary major connector is... C, a posterior palatal bar. And that ends the poll for tonight. Thank you for participating, for everyone that voted. I see some votes coming in. Are you just plugging the answers as we went? <laughs> I'm not too sure, but we'll let you share these results. Thank you very much, Dylan. That was actually very, very informative. Guys, any more questions? I mean, if they have any further questions, they can definitely get in touch with me. Uh, okay. Dr. Okay. Sally can provide my email and then we can have a chat, definitely. Uh, Dr. Hassan, I appreciate the kind words. All the associates, thank you for joining me tonight for this lecture. I really hope I was able to give you some information that you may not have known, but you know, this is all very standard stuff for us. Oh, thank I actually much, had though. a question. I'm so sorry, just one more question. Um, there was sure. one time I saw a maxillary denture being made and what was used was a mesh in that maxillary denture. And I just wanted to know, um, I think I understood correctly that it was used for uh, retention purposes, but can it be used if someone is most likely, mostly dentalist, but may have maybe one or two teeth left and it could be converted into a complete denture? I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. No, I, I have an idea of what you're talking about. And one of the, um major connectors I discussed on this lecture was a full palatal coverage. And one of the indications for that was if it was to be transitioned into uh, an interim complete denture. Um, the only issues I see with that, and, and it works very well in a lot of situations and it's very economically friendly. Uh, the only issue is sometimes the weight from the metal once transitioned into a complete denture doesn't help with retention. Uh, yeah. It can actually be an anti-force to help with retention. So I, I find in situations like that, um, depending on how much that metal framework weighs, especially if it's an older one, um, it may or may not be as conducive to the situation you're talking about. So it's, it's really mm -hmm. give or take on the patient. Um, okay. Yes, I have done it. 
Uh, is it ideal? It depends. Uh, ideally, no, I'd rather have a brand new denture made for those scenarios. But, you know, if it's just a function in the meantime, until they've lost all the teeth, it can work. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that.